For me, one of the best things about having a YouTube channel is the opportunities that it affords me to meet and have interesting conversations with people from all around the world. Recently, I received an email from a viewer in Venezuela who suggested that I might make a video about the ongoing crisis in that country, and in particular, how the heavy legislation of video games back in 2009 was a portent of the awful problems that continue to ravage the country today. I thought that this was a great idea, especially given how the socialist regime that is destroying Venezuela is the inevitable result of what happens when the ideologies of social justice and identity politics are legislated into law. Unfortunately, because of how busy I am now that I'm back to working full-time in game development for WB Games, I responded that I didn't feel that I currently had the time to do the research to do the topic justice. But because I feel that uh, this is such an important subject, that I would gladly boost the signal by airing a reading of an email that he wrote on my channel detailing some of how things went down in his country. He agreed to that idea, provided that I didn't mention him by name, but rather that I used an alias as a way to protect his identity. So what follows here is that email. I've inserted a bit of commentary along the way, but everything else is thanks to the hard work of that Venezuelan gamer who has experienced all of this firsthand. Now, before I dive in, here's just a bit of John Stossel describing just how bad it has gotten in Venezuela to set things up. Venezuela should be rich. Not long ago, Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America. It still has greater oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. But today, Venezuelans starve. These people are fighting over bags of flour. No hay alimentos. No hay nada. And then there's the violence. One Venezuelan is murdered every 20 minutes. Socialism failed in all these places. We are yet to see one socialist country succeed. And yet, sadly, they and other countries refuse to learn the lessons of history. Other countries will give socialism a go. Useful idiots will sing socialism's praises until the last light goes out. Hello, Mr. Levitt. Please call me Alberto Soria. I am a Venezuelan gamer who watches her videos and a silent observer of people calling out the soap just cause for its destructive ways and how said cause eerily mirrors the communist dogma that destroyed my country of birth and upbringing in less than a generation. For a while, I have been thinking on writing to you ideas for videos showing how all the talking points of social justice have been written into law and exercised in Venezuela during the governments of Chavez and Maduro, abolishing meritocracy in the favor of quotas, censorship in the name of undoing violent culture, criminalizing wrong think, going after income sources of dissenters. And the results have consistently been the worsening of the problems that they were allegedly fixing or the creation of a problem where there was none. There is a lot to dig in, but given how Trump's proposal to do bans in violent video games under the long debunked idea has caused SJWs to do a 180 on, on the stances they were preaching for four years in the developed world, and also sparked again the discussion on the effects of video games may have on real-life violence, there is one topic in particular that has become more relevant now. The idea of legislating violent video games has already been tried and tested in Venezuela back in 2009. Back then, there was a strong push claiming video games and toys cultivated a violent culture, and banning them would certainly result in less violent crimes. Back when said law was approved, Venezuela had 13,895 yearly murders, with a population of 28.5 million people. Eight years later, the number of yearly murders skyrocketed to 26,616 murders in 2017, with a population of 31 million people. Commentary here, just for reference, in the United States, the uh, rate of murder is about 5 per 100,000. In Venezuela, it now leads the world with close to 90 per 100,000 people. So back to the email. That is almost double the number of yearly murders in eight years since the law was passed, a hard fact that has only two logical explanations. The first one being that violent video games have no effect on real violence, this is Troy's personal opinion, and instead real life issues such as impunity, a faulty legal framework, promoting gangs and political violence do, things that the government is guilty of, by the way, deaths caused by the Venezuelan government is estimated to be around 6,000 last year. Uh, or uh, in other words, the police have killed about 6,000 Venezuelan citizens. 
The second one being that removing violent video games may actually result in people being more prone to exercise violent impulses on other people as they can no longer do so on fictional characters. This may be true, but I think it's the less likely that it just doesn't impact violence very much. One effect Sedlock clearly had, however, is that it killed the budding Venezuela game, Venezuelan gaming industry as it was showing signs of emergence, and forced most gaming entrepreneurs to abandon this country and start over in other countries. Here are some accounts. In May 2017, indie developer Leonardo Quintero was arrested for creating a mobile game called Chavista Attack, a game he made inspired by the site of Colectivos, political militias armed by the government, constantly surrounding the National Assembly and even attacking the legislators ever since it came into control of the political opposition. The game consisted on shooting armed members of the Colectivos in the streets of Caracas. His arrest was made by the CBIM, an agency that is the equivalent of the CIA in the United States, under the charges of inciting hatred, then announced publicly by Diosdado Cabello in his program Con El Mazo Dondo, Hitting with the Club, in the state-owned VTV channel. Quintero was given conditional freedom one month after his arrest and being imprisoned with no trial on the sole condition he removed the game from the Google Play Store. Then there is the case of the Terravision Games, which by the time the law had passed was the biggest game studio in Venezuela having partnered with Namco and Atari. Seeing what the law meant back in 2009, they decided to open a new office in Bogota, Colombia, which is where the company continues to exist now. This is what Enrique Fuentes, director of the studio, had to, had to say in the New York Times Spanish edition about the law's impact on his studio. It was devastating. I was building this life project in Venezuela. We were growing. We were 30 people in the studio at Caracas, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. We even made a newspaper headline because we became licensed Nintendo DS game developers. Then they come up with this, and from one day to another I was left wondering, what do we do? The biggest irony is that the spark that started this situation was the game Mercenaries 2, a game whose story is a love letter to Chavez regime by socialist Matthew Colville from Pandemic Studios, already owned by EA at the time, and which Chavista legislators clearly didn't play, as they used it as an excuse to pass the law claiming said game was building the ideological groundwork to justify a U.S. invasion of Venezuela. Venezuelan gamer and Chavez supporter Gregory Escobar did get in contact with Colville two years after the law was passed as he disagreed with said law and by playing the game he saw how it resonated with his ideas. Here is a translation of the most relevant pieces of the interview Escobar posted in Aparia. So MC, standing for Matthew Colville, our Pandemic Studios developer, MC, Greg. I'm pleased. I love talking about my job, especially with creative people. See, I consider myself a socialist. What I mean is I believe the people who do the job must control the means of production. Corporations are, by definition, evil and go against the democratic process. This is not the type of information I would willingly express on a normal interview about a video game, but I considered it appropriate for this one. GE, Gregory Escobar. When the bill was debated, the political party PPT showed Mercenaries 2 as evidence. They said Pandemic Studios was working with the CIA and the American military creating war simulators. Mercs 2 was then a tool designed to imprint in the minds of American citizens the idea of invading Venezuela and looting its resources. They say it is fiction, but they have an agenda, is what at one point lawmaker Ismael Garcia said. Being the writer of that video game, what are your impressions about those statements? MC Pandemic developed a game called Full Spectrum Warrior, Warrior, which started as a squad training simulator designed by and in cooperation with the U.S. Army to train soldiers. They paid us to develop it and allowed us to keep the results so we could turn that data into a game. However, Mercenaries 2 was a project developed by a completely different team. We had no connections with anyone in the government, and there was no connection between us and Full Spectrum Warrior. We even used different game engines in our developments. It was, from each project director to the rest of the chain of command, as if we were two different companies working on two different games. 
While we were developing Mercenaries 2, we read an article in a, in a state-owned Venezuelan newspaper in which we were accused of being allied with the U.S. Army and the CIA and mentally conditioning American teenagers for an invasion of Venezuela, etc. We completely ignored that article. I mean, we never thought someone in Venezuela could take it so seriously. When I mean seriously, I refer to people who were not boring old folks sitting in a chair doing nothing, looking for anything to complain about or discuss. Over here, in the United States, we have a similar phenomenon. I mean a lot of people in media saying unfounded stupidities. Therefore, I can say those accusations are categorically false. The only thing we wanted to mentally condition American teenagers for was to give us their money for our job. The conditions that led us to have the game take place in your country were purely artistic. GE, Chuck Kaufman, member of the Alliance for Global Justice and the Venezuelan Solidarity Network, stated that thanks to his efforts and pressure and those of his organizations, two things happened. A, uh, this is Bono from U2, sold his shares in Pandemic and ceased to be an investor in the company. And B, the designers of Mercenary 2, and I suppose the director and writer, agreed to modify the main antagonist, initially similar to Chavez, to the young and corrupt businessman Solano. How much truth is there in that statement? Was Chavez going to confront Nielsen face to face at any point? MC, we never got contacted by anyone on Venezuela's behalf. No government agency, political party, association, not even a journalist until now, three years after the game's release. Bono's capital risk firm called Elevation Partners did sell Pandemic Studios to Electronic Arts, but only because EA offered Elevation a ridiculous sum of money. There was no political motivation there. As a matter of fact, Bono visited our studio. I met him, and he loved all of the projects we were working on. At no point was the villain going to be anyone but Solano, although originally he was going to be younger, about 22 years old. For a long time, he was supposed to be a much more relatable and likable character. I wanted the gamer to think, hey, that guy is coherent, I like him, to later find out he was the bad guy in the story. It would have been an emotional reaction, so the gamer would feel betrayed. It is a shame. We eliminated all of that and turned, in, turned him into a simple and poorly constructed video game villain. I recall that for a very brief period, perhaps less than a day, we were half seriously considering to have that villain Soriano do a coup d'etat against Hugo Chavez. What I mean was to model Hugo Chavez, place him in the game and call him by his name. But at no point we knew it meant to take another route and get into much more political point, into political territory. Sorry there. GE, why did you choose Venezuela for Mercenaries 2? Is Hugo Chavez responsible for it in some way? MC, we never thought seriously to have the plot take place elsewhere. We knew we didn't want to make it happen in the Middle East because with so many soldiers fighting and dying in that place, we thought it would be hard to establish our action video game with a comic book style there. Other sites like Eastern Europe have been overused. We knew we wanted every Mercenaries game to be about a somewhat credible geopolitical situation, not necessarily possible or destined to happen. In this case, what we wanted to show was, hey, the United States get a lot of their oil from Venezuela. Most Americans don't know this. And Venezuela is a very beautiful, very beautiful country with an impressive culture that was very attractive for us. We had, a big, we had big plans for Mercs too, which never came to be. The final game actually shows very little of our original design. GE. One of the main antagonists is called Carmona, just like Pedro Carmona Estanga, the man who did a brief coup d'etat against, against Chavez that lasted 47 hours. You can tell I don't speak Spanish. Was that intentional? Oh yes, that was no coincidence. I needed villain names that were realistic Venezuelan names. Every time I needed realistic names for a certain country, I usually search its government and compile the names of many in the lower ranks. It takes a little work and effort results in fairly authentic names. For no other reason beyond getting a smile on my face, I picked the names of our antagonist characters from a list named Political Prisoners of Venezuela that I found. So to me, this is all very interesting, right? Because this was just a video game in the United States and it ended up becoming a primary reason for outlawing violent video games in Venezuela. In the end game credits on the special thanks segment, I noticed the phrase, the Bolivarian revolution on mundo mejor necesario. It is not far fetched then to think pandemic supports or is at least thanks the existence of the Bolivarian 
How do you say it? Bolivarian revolution. Is that true? My friend and colleague Aaron Contreras put that phrase there. It was his way of po apologizing to the Venezuelan people for what we did to your country. This game did this to this country, right? What did he mean? Two things. Firstly, to us at Pandemic for taking the culture of a whole country and reducing it to a commercial, exploitative, and sensational product. And us as the United States of America for the way in which we supported and financed, maybe not the best, Venezuelans in the past when our corporations went there to have their pockets full and do every kind of atrocities. GE, then isn't it daring to assume daring to assume shows basically the opposite of what the government lawmakers denounced at the time. I felt in Merck's too as an, an, an unstoppable satire of the imperial greed of economic power. The way characters talked was cartoonish. Am I reading too much into it? MC, we certainly wanted to show the American government as hawkish and opportunist imperialists. Thanks, MC. This was under the Bush administration. I got to place my opinions in the mouth of one of the characters when a CIA station chief says, we are here to promote democracy and the people's self-determination or any other lie that character didn't really believe. Then one of the heroes, Chris Jacobs, my personal favorite, says, I wonder, is it really a lie when nobody will believe you anyway? That was me. That was my commentary about the lies that resulted in the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Yes, our president lied to us, but I don't believe nobody truly, but... Yeah, I don't believe nobody truly believed him. I also believe he knew it from the beginning. As an American, it is very easy for me to down to portray our government as greedy liars and our people as mostly idiots. The American soldiers in the game are like ignorant surfers who don't even know where South America is. We designed the American mercenary company as dumb frat boys with unfairly excessive salaries who are there only to party. So, Matthew Colville, we know how you feel about... U.S. soldiers, huh? Cartoonish is a good word for that. Our original goal was more serious, but the final product had much more ample tone. After the interview, Escobar comes to a very telling conclusion on the game and the legislation it produced. After talking with Colville, there was no doubt left. Mercenaries 2 is the most polemic video game nobody played and everybody made assumptions about. This reminds me of Grand Theft Auto or something. Something terrible when it ends up inspiring a reactionary and radically conservative law due to a daring ignorance. A few observations I have to make on this interview. Colville and Contreras made the wrong assumption that the relations between the United States and Venezuela are similar to those the U.S. had with Honduras and Guatemala while favoring fruit companies in those countries. This is inaccurate, as the U.S. has actually white-knighted Venezuela against European powers in the late 19th century and early 20th century, most specifically against the British Empire when they were continuously taking territory from us on the east so they could ultimately leave us without access to the Atlantic Ocean, and against a European coalition that made a blockade to the Venezuelan coast demanding payments for debts Venezuela contracted since our independence war. Second. Another wrong assumption they made is on the involvement of big oil in Venezuelan politics. Since the oil boom in 1917, and until the nationalization of the industry in 1976, there have been three successful coup attempts in the years 1945, 1948, and 1958, and big oil wasn't involved in any of them. When the nationalization happened, they were more than happy to leave the seven years ahead of original schedule and get paid for it, because of the time, they underestimated how much oil we were sitting on. Since 1976, all the exploring, extraction, transport, and refining activities have been made by the state-owned PDVSA, and given the fact Venezuela was allied to the United States and was a reliable provider of oil, an invasion was never on the table. 3. The politicians and media pundits who covered the game in such a sensationalist way had a clear collusion in pushing a narrative aligned with their political agenda with no regards for truth, ultimately seeking to control what messages are people allowed to consume and shut down any voice that didn't fall in line with them. This is a tactic gamer gators may recognize from what Game Journos Pro used to do observing the fact that formers did not have actual political power and succeeded in their goals. This law and its consequences should be a warning sign on what could happen in the United States should anyone who uses the same tactics as those who currently rule Venezuela attain a position in power. 4. This law isn't unique in the legal framework of Venezuela. 
It was preceded by the Social Responsibility Law of Media from 2004, which imposed heavy restrictions in TV and radio stations on what they could transmit, while giving content quotas to the government, followed by a reform to the aforementioned law in 2010 to include internet crimes and award the government a kill switch on sites they don't like. And most recently, the law against hate for Pacific Cohabitation and Tolerance in 2017, which despite the last part of its name shows quite a lot of intolerance by previewing sentences of 10 to 20 years to anyone who posts in social media a message that may be deemed as hate speech. An example of such hate speech is how people sharing and retweeting the videos of Chavista officers and their families enjoying luxuries in first world countries make themselves targets of this law. Five, there's a stark contrast in how the Venezuelan and American governments treated Leonardo Quintero and Matthew Colville respectively. Colville was perfectly allowed to criticize and ridicule his own government and armed forces facing no consequences because he is protected by the First Amendment and his government respected that right of his. Quintero, on the other hand, was supposed to be protected by the 57th article of the Venezuelan Constitution. However, the government ran by people who co-wrote this constitution in 1999, simply overlooked that and proceeded to arrest him with no trial. It is worth asking, what would it be of Coville if he had been in Venezuela while doing work on or after releasing Merckx II? His perceptions about the Chavez regime and his socialist ideas probably wouldn't be the same as the ones he held while living in California with a luck lifestyle that for the average Venezuelan would look luxurious. 6. Despite remaining aligned with the Chavez regime, Escobar couldn't help make an observation on how the far left he supports incurred in a behavior would, one would expect from conservatives back in 2011. This is again another warning sign, as the same pattern is present in those who conform with the regressive left in first world countries, from how much disdain they have against free speech, their willful ignorance about hobbies they want to regulate, their lack of willingness to have an open and honest debate of ideas, and how they shield themselves behind causes of intolerance that they don't even hold themselves up to. The conclusion one can get out of the situation on all the sources is that censoring video games doesn't achieve the stated purpose of reducing violence in real life. Instead, it only works as a means to destroy the income of game developers who may or may not be politically aligned with those in power, disenfranchise gamers by taking choice of content away from them, and worst of all, make an assault on free speech that allows those in power a means to control the messages people consume, no matter if said messages are outright lies. It's this last part, this last sentence here, that I agree with most strongly and, and uh, one of the main reasons that I criticize the social justice movement and why I've been trying to uh, speak with Anita Sarkeesian or any other social justice person because I believe that uh, censoring video games is just a precursor to censoring free speech. Continuing, regardless of where people stand in the political spectrum, this is the kind of legislation they wouldn't want to live under if a political opponent was in power. And supporting it is, if anything, a sign of authoritarianism from those proclaiming virtuous stances. Finally here, if you would like to make a video on this topic, I would be more than happy to help getting more information. The only thing I ask for in exchange is to remain anonymous. As unlike people in your country, I have been robbed of my voice due to an, due to an increasingly authoritarian framework taking away my rights. I am also currently on my way out of here. And even after I leave for a free and more prosperous land, I will have to renew my passport before I can apply for citizenship, which means I will still have to watch what I say and write for a while. I would also like to put out a warning message to the skeptic and anti-SJW communities. When you people make a random comment about Venezuela or make a video on how Venezuela is in ruins due to the socialism and so social justice policies, you are much more close to the truth than you imagine. All it takes for you to gather how the talking points of the regressive left mirror policies that were enacted in Venezuela with disastrous results is to ask for any Venezuelan who looks at your videos or reads your tweets to share their experiences. And you can become our voices in times when we have already been silenced, while you are still on time to use and protect your voices.
Also, regardless if you decide to run with this idea for a video or not, please delete this email from your inbox once you are done with it to minimize the chances of me being doxxed and have that information weaponized by the regime as due process has stopped being a thing for here, thing here for years. Warm regards, alias Alberto Soria. Well, Mr. Soria, on behalf of gamers worldwide, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to assemble this information and send me this email of warning. I see it as a prime example of how the dangers of social justice ideologies can overflow their original intentions of promoting safety and equality to become an authoritarian torrent of oppression and destruction. And even though I feel pretty confident that video gaming is currently well protected in the U.S., thanks to the First Amendment and the 2011 Supreme Court case of Brown vs. the Entertainment Merchants Association, we would all be wise to learn from the cautionary tale that is the sad state of Venezuela. One never knows what the future may bring. And so, at least while we still can, game on, my friends. <laughs>